I'm, I'm Peter to TPM and uh, yeah, Peter asked me to come along and um, talk about what I've been doing with solar. Um, earlier this year, uh, my wife and I visited Tibet and uh, northern China and uh, I was amazed to see how much solar power is used there. I mean, there is electricity widely distributed around the place, but basically every house has solar panels and uh, a lot of, it's all low voltage stuff. And all of the markets, the street markets, have shops, multiple shops selling solar panels, controllers, batteries and things. And I thought, gee, if they can do it there, then, you know, we can do it here. Um, I, I peeked inside someone's house and uh, you'll, this is a pretty common kind of setup with um, a low voltage distribution area. You can see a battery there. Uh, they've got uh, chargers for phones and obviously, the, you know, there's a car radio deck and everything. And, and people are really... Um, uh, quite well set up for this. There seems to be a very common uh, low power lighting system which is basically used as the primary light. So it actually, I'm not sure how it works, but it seems to be a low voltage compact fluorescent light, a little controller, battery and a panel, and you just see them on every house. So, um, so I was amazed to see that. Plus they also use a lot of electric scooters uh, everywhere around Lhasa and everything, but they're charged from the mains. Um, so I, I wanted to put in a new shack at, uh, at home, and uh, this is it being constructed. I'll show you how it looks at the end. Um, too small. Too small. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, uh, and I decided that uh, I should try to power the whole thing from solar rather than running uh, electric wiring out to the shed. Pardon? Any windows? Any windows? Yes, there are windows. This is while it's being built. That's right. Okay. So in going through this, I, um, I learned a few things uh, from doing some reading and, uh, and making some inquiries. So I just thought I'd take through a few things about the sun, what power is available, the different kinds of photovoltaic cells that are available, uh, a little bit about batteries, and that's still an evolving area, um, charge controllers, and I'll explain why they're a really, really good idea, uh, a couple of case studies, and uh, just some other resources that, um, that I suggest you look at. So firstly, let's look at uh, the sun. Um, the sun uh, uh, basically uh, shines on the earth and gives us about 1,360 uh, watts per square metre at, at the equator. Now because of atmospheric effects, we basically get about one kilowatt per square metre at, um, at the surface of the earth. So that's the energy that's available from the sun per square metre, which is actually, I think, an impressive amount. Now of course, um, that reduces as the cosine of the angle of the sun. So as the sun goes down in the morning or afternoon or on the earth, um, the cosine effect takes place. But more than that, there's atmospheric attenuation. So in the morning and the evening, I mean, you can even look at the sun and it won't damage your eye too much. So really the, the message, the take out there is you want to charge your system during those middle, four, they say five hours, I reckon about four hours in the middle of the day. That's where you want to position your cells to get the maximum charge. So what about your location on the earth? Um, if you're at the equator, then that's great. Uh, the sun, of course, is directly overhead from, um, uh, for different times of the year between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. So if you're on the equator, you've got the maximum. Outside those, if you're further north or further south, then you, you're on more of an angle. Um, the Earth's, uh, you know, is, is on an angle of 23 degrees on its rotation, which is why we get seasons. Um, so the sun is lower, of course, during local winter. So sometimes, you know, obviously you want to tilt your panel. The, the rule of thumb is that you tilt the panel according to your latitude, but often people will tilt the panel a bit lower to take advantage of the winter sun more than the summer sun when it's not so much of a problem. So what about during each day? Um, if you've ever looked at those uh, UV radiation plots, you'll see how that curve goes during the day. So again, obviously, it's the middle hours in the sun, you know, during the day are, are the most important ones. There are systems that track the sun. You know, they have either a servo motor and uh, there's some even some, apparently some bush systems that are somehow passive and use uh, heating fluids and things like that. Um, I spoke to a few people about these things and basically they are required for focused systems. These are systems with mirrors in them. But for any normal system, the, the extra expense and the complexity and the maintenance and you know, all of those factors mean that your money is better spent if, you, if you're on the edge of having enough capacity, just put in another panel, 
put in you know, a few more panels rather than doing anything mechanical. Um, I spoke to, you know, Jeff Johnson, the guy that uh, walked across Australia, he, he told me that, I met up with him when he was in Sydney, and he said he'd seen so many amazing solar tracking systems all broken down across the country that uh, it's just, just a waste of time. So let's talk about solar panels. Um, there's a couple of different kinds of, of uh, panels, but this is an area where there's a lot of research going on. Even in the past week, I've been looking at videos about 3D solar panels and all this kind of thing. Um, there's three main types. There's monocrystalline, polycrystalline, which some manufacturers call uh, multicrystalline, and then there's thin film amorphous, which are those sort of flexible ones. The most efficient for a given area are the monocrystalline cells. So the monocrystalline, you can see the one on the left there, that's, that's the one I use, it's a 65 watt panel. You can tell them because they tend to be cut, or they are cut from a a single wafer of silicon, so they tend to have a very even look about them, and you'll often see that they've been cut from a circle, from a circular wafer. You see the corners are cut out there. Uh, they are the most expensive because they are made from a large wafer of silicon, crystallized silicon. Um, they're typically 12 to 17 percent efficient uh, in terms of the area. Um, and one drawback they have over the others is they tend to derate with temperature faster than the other kinds of cells. So uh, typically uh, panels derate at about 0.5 degrees, 0.5% per degree. And uh, I'll talk about it a bit later on, but, but basically that has quite a big effect in the hot Australian sun. A cheaper alternative is uh, the polycrystalline cells. And uh, you can tell them because you can see the crystals in there. And this is one here that uh, Peter brought along. They are cheaper uh, because they're easier to manufacture. Um, the efficiency is in the range of 11 to 14 percent. So remember, mono was uh, 12 to 17. So there is an overlap. You will find polycrystalline cells that have a higher efficiency than monocrystalline cells. But in general, you know, if, if space is a premium, then then you would go with a mono. Uh, so you you need more area basically for the same power output. For a lot of people, that doesn't matter. But maybe on a boat or something, then you might be a bit pushed for space. Yeah. Just. You're saying this one is a 65 watt panel. Oh yeah, what's this one? This one's 45. Okay, yeah, it's almost the same size. And almost the same size, but a lot less. Mind you, that's probably 15 years old. Right. Yeah, they are slowly getting better. Um, but uh, yeah, you need to be careful about what's being advertised. So the final kind, um, amorphous thin film. And uh, these ones can be flexible. They're often put on a flexible backing. Um, they have less silicon in them, so they're, they're cheaper. They're also made out of other materials, uh, cadmium, uh, gallium, and uh, organic polymer. Their efficiency is quite low, uh, 6 to 9%. So they're a lot less efficient. So they're good for kind of on a boat, just keeping the battery topped up perhaps, not, not so much for a big uh, daily discharge recharge cycle. Um, the flexibility is a good feature, perhaps on a boat. Uh, you can mount them on curved surfaces and so on. Uh, it can be a bad one. Now, I mentioned uh, this is the cell that Jeff Johnson, his, his VK4XJJ, he carried this, uh, he wore it, I'll show you a photo later on, when he walked across Australia. And um, you can see he's got a little clamp down here. He found that after a while it stopped charging and it was because of just in, in just the flexing of it, uh, obviously the terminal had become loose, so he had to have a clamp to keep it going. Um, Okay, so an illuminated panel has a voltage on its terminals, but as you draw current from it, that, I mean, it starts out if they're open circuit, as you draw current, then that voltage drops, and it follows a curve, looks a bit like this, and um, basically, the more current you draw, the lower the voltage that comes out of it. But it is a curve, it's not a straight line. So there is a point somewhere in the middle that is the maximum power point of the panel and it varies for different panels and different conditions and ideally you want to draw, the, you want to balance the current and voltage out of the panel to hit that point to get the maximum out of it. Um, it it's called Pmax or there'll be you know Imax, Pmax, it'll be in the specifications. So let's have a look at some of the specifications of a typical cell. This is a large uh, Kirasira panel, 200 watt panel and um, you notice that they give the performance at two different temperatures. Uh, so they've got 25 degrees and they've got 45 degrees. Um, now, for some reason, they also give it a different 
uh, illumination. I don't know why they've changed two factors when they're giving it there. Um, so in this one, they, they give the performance of 25 and 45. The Pmax is 215 watts at, at the optimum point on that curve. Um, so the voltage Pmax for this particular panel, this is a big high voltage panel, is 26 volts. The IP Max is 8 amps. This is a really big grunty, this is like as big as me. Um, VOC is the open circuit voltage and in this case it's 33 volts and ISC is the current with a short circuit and that's 8 amp. So this is, this is quite a big panel. But it's interesting how the specs are kind of different across different manufacturers. It's a little bit hard to get a grip on what's, what's going on. Here's a little 20 watt, uh, 12 volt panel. So the Pmax is 20 watts. Um, open circuit voltage is 21.5. Uh, the short circuit current is 1.3 amps. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so it's just different abbreviations for the same thing. Now, interestingly, they have test conditions at um, 1,000 watts per metre, which is what you'd expect, and at 25 degrees. Now, 25 degrees C in the midday sun, I mean, you're not going to be running at 25 degrees, so it's going to be 40 or... Uh, in fact, quite very high temperatures are seen by solar panels on the roof in, in Australia. Uh, some panels give a knocked normal operating temperature. Uh, as a way of, of doing it, but as I said, you just want to be wary that you're not going to get what, what it looks like when you first look at the specs. They're all talking about Pmax all the time. Um, there's some other features to look at when you're buying panels. Um, one of them is uh, blocking diodes. Um, when you're putting a lot of panels, when you're putting panels in parallel and you have one that's in shade, so if you've got a roof perhaps where there's some shade coming across trees or other buildings and things, if there's a panel in shade and a panel that's illuminated, you'll actually get backwards current flowing through the panels that are in shade. So a lot of panels will advertise that they have blocking diodes uh, just to stop that occurring. There'll just be something that's built in as a feature. Now, of course, blocking diodes have a draw drawback, which is that they have a forward voltage drop. It might be 0.6 volts. Uh, some of them will say they use Schottky diodes, which I think are point, does anyone know, point 0.2 or something. Two or something. Yeah, something like so. Schottky diodes have a lower, so that's a good feature, I guess, is Schottky blocking diodes. Um, of course, the other thing is that if you are going for a higher voltage, then you'll wire up panels in series to get a higher voltage. And for these ones, uh, you might have one panel that's illuminated with current flowing through a panel that's not illuminated, and it, apparently the current that you get through a panel with low illumination limits what can go through it. It not only doesn't generate power, but it actually reduces the current that can flow through. So in this case, there are panels that have uh, bypass diodes on them. And once again, uh, actually, it doesn't matter with Schottky, does it? So what should you pay for panels? Um, just looking at ads around the place, uh, basically, uh, as you go up, so this is 10 watts, 65, 120. If you work it out, this is just advertised prices in Australia. $5 per watt comes down a little bit as you go up. So you kind of expect that, I guess, mounting overhead and things like that, that, um, that there is a point where it goes up. Going up uh, beyond this, like a 200 watts, I notice that they actually get a bit more expensive again. So I guess if you're putting in a big system, you, you know, they're just the bigger mounting and everything. Um, these examples are interesting because I, when I was looking around for panels, I was looking on eBay and there are some ads for panels that come out of some other countries which have crazy prices and crazy areas for the amount of power they claim to get out. So uh, just have a look at the areas. Um, this is sort of typical, so um, basically 80 watts per square metre, 100 watts, 119 watts. So they get a bit better as they go up in size, again, presumably because there's less wasted space with mounting and so on. But you will see ads for panels that are kind of double the output for a given area. And I have read reports of people saying they've got panels that they've imported, they've got them home and they've been very disappointed. They've put out sort of half the power. One guy I read said that um, he'd put a panel out in the weather for a while and then the sticker on the back had fallen off and there was another sticker underneath it, it was about half. So, <laughs> so you want to sort of watch out for, um, watch out what you're buying. And I mean, they're, they're really working hard on making panels more efficient. And if you see someone who's got a two times better performance than the other manufacturers, then be a little bit suspicious about it. These are all monocrystalline I'm talking about here, by the way. Um, now, basically, when you're coming to put panels up in a site, you want to look at the shade. And uh, what I did at, at my place was um, uh, I put up a camera 
taking stop motion images every 10 minutes through a day so I could see the shadows. We've got trees and things around. So I could see where the sun you know, was, was traveling around there. There are actually some devices. Um, there's a thing called, a, it's a commercial gadget called a solar pathfinder. And uh, it comes with these inserts for different latitudes uh, around the world. And uh, you put it at the site and then it's got this uh, reflective dome over the top of it and you look down on it and then what you do is you trace the tree line and the building line and everything and it will actually calculate for you um, so you sort of put a pencil in and draw underneath the glass what you see and then it will work out what proportion of the sun is going to be blocked so you can kind of optimize where you are around the place around the site um, I've ended up not actually facing my panel north because I've got more trees in that location so I get the sun sort of in in the middle of the day it doesn't matter so much but um, yeah, it's interesting to see how uh, a site, it, it, it's, I found it quite odd. I, I, when I looked at my own backyard, where I expected the best place to be, the sun was not. So obviously when you're mounting, you know, you want to avoid shade in the middle of the day in particular. Um, the optimum angle is, is um, equal to your latitude. But as I said, sometimes people favour the winter a little bit. Um, Sydney's at minus 34 degrees, of course. So 34 degrees facing north uh, would be the way to go. Um, now I mentioned the temperature derating, it's about 0.5% per degree so you know, if you can get the panel up off the roof a bit that, that makes a big difference. I believe some European studies have said that um, having a panel um, 10 centimetres of off the roof is, is the best for keeping it cool. I mean in Australia you get a, a really high temperature and that you know you can have 80 degrees or something on a panel on the roof and uh, the, the panels, uh, someone was mentioning their system actually shuts down on a hot day, might have been uh, John. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm doing something very simple. I've got a corrugated iron roof and, roof and I'm just lying it on top of that, but I'm fully aware that that's not ideal. Um, obviously, if you're camping or something, then sometimes a folding panel is better. And I know people who use you know, folding systems where they can have, you might have your campsite under, under shade, obviously, but you want to have the solar panel out in the middle somewhere. Okay, so we've got the panel. Obviously, we want to store some power. Um, so let's talk a bit about batteries. Um, now, Lead acid batteries, car batteries, of course, are designed for that, you know, they're cheap, they're widely available, but they're designed for that high crank current, initial current for starting a battery. They're not so good for uh, solar systems. Uh, this is the battery I'm using. This is a uh, 150 amp hour battery. It looks somewhat similar to the one Peter's bought over there. Um, uh, the the cr high crank current batteries like car batteries have porous plates. They're designed to have a very low internal resistance so they can give that incredible current. But unfortunately, if you deep discharge them, the plates break down. Pieces break off them, they just start to fall apart. So if you deep discharge a car battery, you'll get very few cycles out of them. They, they really don't last very long. So that's why you see all these um, deep discharge batteries being advertised. Um, my primary battery, it's called a, a VRLA, valve release lead acid. So it's still lead acid liquid battery, but it has a, it's sealed. So sometimes they call sealed lead acid. Um, it's rated 150 amp hours, but note that that's rated over uh, 10 hours. And I think uh, Peter, who was talking earlier, it's funny how they, they, it's a little bit, it's not 150 amps for one hour. It's, a, I think you were saying the car batteries are, or well, the battery you're using are rated over 20 hours. Yeah. Yeah. This one actually says uh, slash 10 hours on it, but um, they're often kind of uh, bundled up in the, um, in the spec somewhere. Um, this cost me $399 and it was, I bought it out of a place in Perth. Uh, when they delivered it, uh, the delivery guy knocked on the door and said, you better give me a hand. It was 40 kilos. <laughs> um, okay, there's other types that you'll see uh, advertised like gel cells. Now gel cells have the electrolyte in a jelly. Um, they can operate in any position is probably the main benefit of those. Uh, they're very stable. They do have a higher internal resistance. Uh, there's also absorbed glass mat, which is, um, they have um, a glass mat that's sandwiched between the electrodes and the electrolyte is held in there uh, using just capillary action. Um, a benefit of those ones, I believe, is that if there is any gassing, the gas stays in place and can actually be reabsorbed. Normally, like with a valve release lead acid battery, if you gas it, if you overcharge it, I'll talk a bit about more on that in a sec, um, then that gas is lost and that electrolyte is lost and basically you, you've damaged the battery. Uh, expanded calcium. Uh, calcium is added to the electrodes. I believe that reduces gassing and uh, extends the life. 
there are other types of batteries, and uh, uh, you mentioned them earlier, um, uh, things like nickel cadmium, lithium ion, so on. These are all much more expensive and uh, probably not uh, important unless you've got an application where weight is important. And obviously in an electric car, if you could bring the weight down, then you're going to use less power. In a shack or shed or something, it's just sitting on the ground, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's have a look at the specs of different batteries. Um, okay, so this is, this is my battery here, 150 amps over 10 hours. Now there's a couple of different voltages they give. The cycle use voltage, this is the voltage that you should charge it up to when you're going to cycle it. So when you're going to do a deep cycle during the day. So you charge it up to 14.4 to 15, fairly high, on the expectation you're going to discharge it a few percent, 10 percent say. Standby use is when you're using a battery as a backup power supply. So maybe it's uh, um, you know, for a computer system or something like that. And so you, you just leave it at a lower voltage, just sort of uh, topping it up as it goes along. Um, the maximum current uh, is the current that you should put through it before it's at risk of gassing. So you want to make sure that your um, charge controller is not going to overcharge it. Um, you'll also see other specs like um, uh, the open circuit voltage and the cutoff voltage. Open circuit voltage, if it's got no load on it, then you know, it'll be 14 volts or something. Cutoff voltage is the voltage below which you should not discharge any further. Uh, what happens is you get sulfation and then you start to damage the battery. Um, and uh, let's see, Dis batteries do self-discharge, of course, just through chemical action. And interestingly, um, as the temperature goes up, they self-discharge faster. So there's a few things to watch when we're working with a battery, both charging it and discharging it to extend life. And of course, to do that, you don't want to do that manually. So there's the thing called charge controllers. And uh, charge controllers have come along fantastically in the last few years because they're just all computers. Um, you could just connect the battery to a, to a uh, panel. Oh, yeah, here's one. Um, this is a simple one. Um, 21 amp, 12 volt charge controller. Peter brought along. Uh, here's another little one. And these ones have pretty basic things on. This has just got a light to say it's charging and a light to say that it's charged, and that's about it. Uh, they're pretty simple. Um, I bought in a, a, a nicer one, which I got from Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of the good ones have, um, have a nice informative display. So they'll show you the voltage of the battery, they'll show you the charge current, they'll show you the discharge current if you wire things through the charge controller. Uh, some of them do logging. Um, so this one shows whether it's currently charging and whether it's discharging at the moment. Um, this one was $80. Uh, I know locally you can buy them for about $150, quite a nice one from JCAR. Uh, the modern charge controllers all use pulse width modulation to vary the charging of the battery, so they're not going to get hot or, or waste much power. Um, and uh, I mentioned also the, um, that, you know, that power point, the maximum power point. Some of the more sophisticated ones, not this one, have, um, they call it MPPT tracking. So it's maximum power point tracking. So what they'll actually do is they'll, they'll play with the, with the panel and they'll do a little algorithm to walk along that curve of, of uh, current versus voltage and they'll find the right point for the battery. Now believe it, it also can alter with temperature. So they'll sort of try to find that maximum power point out of, out of the system that's operating. Um, other things that uh, the charge controller can do is you can attach the load instead of directly to the battery through the charge controller and then it will disconnect the load if the, if the voltage gets too low to avoid completely discharging the battery. Uh, another feature I've seen is um, cell equalisation. Uh, in a multi-cell series battery you can get one cell that's perhaps not fully charged at some point and it stays out of kilter, it just discharges and recharges. So overall the overall battery voltage has gone down. So some of the charges will from time to time basically deliberately overcharge the battery just to bring all the cells back to the equalisation again. Uh, some of the specs you'll see are things like zero load loss. So that's essentially the power that the charge controller itself uses. Um, I think uh, my one is 30 milliamps. So it's, you know, it's, it's drawing a little bit from the battery, but not a great deal. Uh, there'll also be a voltage drop through the charge controller into, um, from the, cell, the panel into the battery. And uh, mine's 170 millivolts, so that's pretty low. I don't think it's a relay, but it's, um, but it's pretty efficient. Um, some charge controllers have temperature 
compensation. So they'll charge the battery at a lower rate if the temperature is higher to avoid gassing. And some even have an external connection where you can actually connect the uh, temperature sensor to the battery and have it actually measure it accurately. Um, and there's also a maximum voltage uh, spec on them. I am aware of a homebrew controller, uh, VK2ZZM, I stumbled across. I don't know, uh, I know someone who's tried to build it, but I'm not sure it sounds interesting, but uh, it's a little microprocessor control kit. Um, just a note on uh, wiring, 12-volt uh, wiring, I reckon, is, um, is in a bit of a shambles, but the four-wheel drive community has, uh, has got some good standards. I quite like the Anderson power pole connectors. You're probably all familiar with those. And I use these, um, these boards that have a fuse on each um, outlet, uh, the fuse distribution boards. Um, you know, 12 volt uh, equipment uh, can draw power when it's switched off. I've got an ICOM radio and uh, when it's turned off, it's very low power, but um, I know uh, uh, Peter's got some gear that draws um, uh, quite a bit of power even when switched off, like modern transistorized gear with an, you know, an electronic on off switch. So um, uh, it's worthwhile having a master switch. Um, now, the big question, I think, when, and when I was trying to work out my system was to work out, well, what panel, well, what, what my load is, what I want to run, uh, what my panel will be in order to provide enough current to supply that power, and, um, and then how much I need to store in the battery. So that's a big question in everyone's minds. So uh, to balance the panel to the battery to the load, um, I, I built up a little, um, a little logger and... Um, my initial system, I had the 65 watt panel, that one on the left, on, on your right, uh, and I had a smaller battery, I had a 26 amp hour battery. And I thought that roughly that would be okay. My load is, I've got, a, I've got an LED lighting system that draws one amp, and I've got a transceiver that draws 1.3 amps on receive, and who knows what on transmit. And in theory, that should have been enough, but in practice, what I found over a few days was that wasn't enough. Um, so what I found was that the battery would, would start to droop and then when the sun came up in the early morning, it would basically come back to full charge very quickly. So I wasn't really getting the full use of the sun there. Um, now this trace, the first three days here, are uh, my just sort of activity and you'll see big downward spikes. So the first three days are the 26 amp hour battery and then I replaced it with the 150 amp hour battery. So basically these giant downward spikes were when I was using the transceiver and things during the day. And after I replaced it with 150 amp hour battery, things got much better. So I kind of learned it by, by um, trying it out. Uh, the logger, I just used, I don't know if you use the Arduino little boards. There's a, there's a, a board that takes a, uh, an SD card and you can, it's got some example code where you can write a line to a text file. And it's also very handily got a real-time clock in it. So it's got a battery back real-time clock. So the thing can just sit there and I just use the onboard um, analog to digital converter and I just had it log every few minutes. Yeah, I think that um, silicon chip makes it like Computer, can oh, it can do the same. Yeah, chip. I mean, there's actually custom loggers. They're quite expensive, actually, some of the industrial logging uh, devices. So this was relatively cheap. Um, so I've now got the 20 watt panel. I've got a 20 watt panel as well. It's just charging that other battery is kind of a second system. So every day, basically, we've got um, energy going in is is being stored. Energy's being taken out of storage. So the question is, how much do we need to store, and how much do we um, how much do we uh, need to store in the battery, basically? How much do we need to put into the battery? How much do we need to take out? So I'll just do a little sizing exercise. Now remember that um, energy is power times the number of times the amount of time. So uh, that's measured in watt hours. So you'd be familiar with your electricity bill in, in kilowatt hours. Um, one kilowatt hour, by the way, I looked up is um, 3.6 megajoules. To see, yeah, it's quite a, quite a lot of joules. Um, I've got an LED light that draws one amp. It's very bright, by the way. LED lights today are just fantastic. Um, so the input from my solar panel is um, I've got uh, I need at least 60 watt hours. Um, you're, you're only going to get P max for a few hours. So I, I use four as a rule of thumb uh, during the day. Of course, this week has thrown it all into chaos because we, we had no sun. Um, and the battery loss is um, 
they reckon you lose about 10% just with internal resistance in your battery. The other big loss in systems apparently is wiring. Uh, it's typical to lose 5% in just resistive losses in wiring. So obviously you want to put um, uh, high current devices very close to the battery if possible. And of course, um, panels are derated with temperature quite significantly. Um, the controller will lose a bit, diodes will lose a bit, things like that. So in terms of the storage, you've got now, again, batteries are measured in amp hours, which seems odd rather than actually talking about um, uh, in watt hours. So amp hours is obviously multiplied by the volts is watt hours. So I've got a 26 amp hour battery times 12 volts is 312 watt hours. Um, typically amp hours, as I mentioned, are, are you know, measured over like 10 hours or something. The, the other thing to, to keep in mind, although you might say, oh, gee, the battery's fine, I've got heaps of space, as I think I did with the 26 amp hour battery, if you, the more you discharge a battery, the shorter its life. So a good rule of thumb is to try to discharge the battery only 10%, and then you get many more cycles out of it. So um, with my system of uh, 60 watt hours needed for my LED lighting, I, I would end up where I was discharging the battery 20% each day, which is a bit too much. And as you saw from that graph with the spikes, I could actually see the fact that I was taking too much from the battery uh, each day. And of course, the other factor to put in there with, when choosing a battery is, well, how many days do I want to be able to operate without sun? So obviously, if you can have more capacity in the battery, you can operate for more days. So just in summary, that system, I would have got about 68 uh, 0.4 watt hours in from the solar panel which would give me 60 watt hours out to the LED lighting system and I've still got a little bit over but having said that even though it looks good on paper I found I needed a much bigger battery than what was sort of showing up in the calculations and of course um, you know the battery uh, that battery that the, the um, 26 amp hour could only store five times what I needed I think you need something even bigger than that so I went for a 150 amp hour battery so finally, I, the shed was finished, and um, here's how it looks. So, uh, as I said, I'm just a very simple construction. It's got a door, it's got a window, yeah. Uh, and I've just got a little, um, the 65 watt panel and the 20 watt panel. Now that's actually not north on this side. North is on the other side, but I've got quite a lot of trees on the other side. So after watching it for a little while, I found that it was just better to have it in this space where it's not, as, not facing the sun as much, but it's got less shade on it. This works out really well. I've basically been running this now for a couple of months, uh, just purely on solar panel. Uh, I'm running my ham gear, which probably only use a few hours each day. I've also got a, a 12 volt soldering iron, um, and uh, someone even gave me an old scope iron, which I don't know what that draws. They're amazing, the, the farmer's friend, they're called. Um, if, you, if you push the, thing, the ring on the scope iron connected to a battery, yeah, it's interesting. He, he gave it to me, he said, don't cut the cord. Yeah, it's a really long cord because the, the cord's actually uh, resistive. Well, the original transformers, they run on a 3.3 volt. Yeah, so it must be 3 volt, yeah. It, it glows red hot if you hold it down. It's amazing, yeah. A um, couple of case studies. I mentioned uh, Jeff Johnson. Uh, I, I met up with him. You've probably heard he's a, the guy's walked across Australia for a second time. Um, and uh, he, he used that uh, flexible panel. He, um, he charged 10 uh, 2,500 milliamp hour nickel metal hydride double A cells is what his main charge uh, battery was. And it's a unisolver, it's just a uh, unisolar 5 watt panel. Um, for that, with that power budget, he was able to run a daily SCED using an FT817 each day. Uh, he ran a digital camera, a couple of AA batteries. He had a GPS, uh, just a, not a a car GPS, a low power GPS, an AM radio, just two batteries, a satellite phone which he topped up and he had a little digital voice recorder and that's what he used and he just carried. So when he was walking he walked south to north so he just had it on his front like that uh, charging up each day. As I said he ran into that problem where one of the um, uh, electrodes just delaminated or, or came loose. He had to put a, you can even see it there, the little clip on there. Uh, Patrick, VK2PN, I don't know if anyone knows uh, Patrick, good guy, uh, I think he's out camping at the moment and uh, he's got uh, two 60 watt panels and two 70 amp hour batteries and he runs a fridge, a Waco fridge. Uh, be a bit careful with fridges, um, there's a lot of fridges around but the, the, the ones that run on multiple, um, multiple power sources are pretty inefficient and uh, fridges also um, need a lot of power to get, that, to get the compressor going. 
So uh, I don't know whether it's realistic to run a fridge on a small solar system. I have this grand plan to have a little drink fridge in the shed. But Patrick's also got uh, five 20 watt panels um, for the van that he just mounts on top. Now he runs a ham radio when he's out running around, and as similar to mine, it's 1.5 amps on receive. I can't believe all these radios drawing one amp on receive. What is going on? I mean, this is cr I couldn't believe my my ICOM. I mean, that's just, they, heaters or something. Yeah, it's like a valve radio. Why aren't they 20 milliamps? I don't know. My Ellicraft K3 transceiver runs just a couple of hundred milliamps. Yeah, and I believe the new, the KX3 is supposed to be like that too. Yeah, that's good. So just to summarise, um, uh, we talked about the sun. You've got uh, basically a kilowatt per square metre available, which is fantastic. Uh, different kinds of cells, the mono, uh, poly and thin film and their efficiencies. All of them uh, derate with temperature quite dramatically. The, um, the most efficient ones for area are the mono crystalline ones on, the, um, on your right. Um, uh, but they do actually derate faster than poly. Um, we talked about batteries. Uh, you probably don't want to get a car battery. The other thing to watch out for is um, second-hand car batteries. Uh, just a really bad idea. And uh, the open circuit voltage on a car battery might look terrific. But uh, it basically, they've, they've suffered. Second hand for a reason. They're secondhand for a good reason. They're no good for this application. Um, charge controllers, a fantastic piece of technology, and they'll extend the life of the battery, well worth the money. And uh, um, they're, they're really, uh, they are great. And they're also, uh, there are actually other specialist devices that you can put in line to monitor. Uh, they'll keep logs of things like the, um, you know, the amp hour through each day, like going back several days and things like that. Um, but yeah, modern charge controls. I just think it's great to be able to look up and see what the battery is at right now. And plus they could protect the battery. Uh, a couple of resources I, I uh, just want to mention. Um, there's a magazine which I hadn't seen before. I was talking to somebody about it called Renew Magazine. Um, I don't know that it's widely in the shops. You can subscribe to it online. They've got a guy, uh, Lance Turner, who writes technical articles in it, and he does a great job. And he uh, periodically they do these giant comparison tables where they go through every solar panel and every battery and all this sort of thing. Uh, very detailed. Um, so that's worth having a look out for. And um, uh, this week, it turns out in Sydney, there is a big show, solar energy show. Uh, it starts on Wednesday at Darling Harbour. It's free to get into. Uh, if you're interested, you can register and go along to that. I'm going along on Wednesday afternoon. It's um, www.aupvse.com.au and you can kind of register and go along. But if you search for Solar Energy Ex Exhibition Sydney, you'll find it. And uh, finally, a uh, plug. Uh, after I did all this research, I turned it into a little electronic book, um, which is available for um, less than $3 on the <laughs> iBook store and uh, on the Kindle. So uh, thank you very much. Very good. Any questions?